Good morning, everyone. This is the Afterglow Live Recap Podcast. My name is Sia. Oh, and I'm Erin Greger. Sorry. <laughs> and we are welcoming back a friendly face and amazing colleague, Mr. Jay Fairbrother, with my B2B coach and also Dallas coach or Dallas chair of the Pittsburgh chapter. Welcome back, Jay. Thanks, guys. Good to be here. So happy belated New Year! So uh, let's 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 just talk about the New Year, guys. Are we? What's our word of the year? What's your word of the year? Just out of curiosity, do you have one? Okay. Ah, wow! I would say um, hopeful. Hopeful. I love that. Why do you say hopeful? Uh, vaccines are coming someday, um, and we'll get back to life as normal. Right. Absolutely. Aaron, what's your word of the year? So I actually have two and I'm going to be honest with you. It's a, a, a pullover from last year. Cause I didn't feel like I really had the up. Well, I did, but I didn't, I need to hone in. So first is service. It's a big one. I need to be more service driven. And the second is CEO, like really think of pulling myself up and thinking like a CEO versus a doing a job. Oh, that's great. That's great for me. It was opportunity. Um, I feel like I think everyone's optimistic uh, at the beginning of the year, but I do feel like there's so much opportunity here that we can embrace uh, that maybe was or was not available to us. And maybe our eyes are open to seeing it and receiving it. So um, I just thought I would ask that question because uh, I'm going to shout out to JD Fish, Fishbine. Oh my gosh, JD, I'm sorry if I said your last name correctly. He asked, he posed that question yesterday on LinkedIn and it got me thinking. So thanks for humoring me guys. So this week we had Mr. Keith Kirkland with ACAP, <clears throat> ACAP uh, join uh, GLOW this week to talk about the most exciting topic ever, you guys. PPP loans part de. Are we excited? Are we excited? It's, a, it's a riveting topic. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, it's like, a, you know, I'm not going to lie. Every time I hear PPP loans, I kind of roll my eyes. I'm like, okay, what kind of uh, hoops are we jumping through now? What amount of paperwork? So, Jay, uh, you went through this process last year. Could you just give us a summary, like, of your experiences and your thoughts on the first round uh, of last year? Yeah. So it was crazy. Um, you know, the idea of free money uh, was is such a foreign concept. Um, and there, you know, even up until after I applied for my forgiveness and to the moment that I actually, I would say even beyond the moment that I heard that I had 100 percent forgiveness, I was still in disbelief. I was like, there's got to be a catch here. There's got to be something that is going to you know, circle back and, and get on me. Um, so I had gotten, uh, when I, when I first submitted for forgiveness, I had gotten the notice that, uh, the loan or, or the form said that there would be a hundred percent forgiveness and I was still in doubt. And then I finally got a letter from the bank that I went through, um, verifying that I had been 100% forgiven and, and I was like, finally, you know, relieved. Yeah. But the, the whole first round, I mean, it was chaotic is is an understatement um it, it was a complete mess you know you have lawmakers creating this thing who know nothing about actual financing and then they turn it over to the sba who turn it over to banks without any guidance so the the entire process in, including in my case i went for the ten thousand dollar advance um it's called a eidl and i got and i, and I applied for that and then after I applied for it, they came out with a rule that that was not going to be forgiven if you got a PPP loan. So you'd still have to pay back that $10,000. So, you know, it was like, shit, you know, if I had known that, I wouldn't have even gone for the 10,000. Um, but anyway, I got my PPP loan. It was, you know, it, it took um, <clears throat> a, a couple months, I think, really, because the banks just weren't ready to actually, you know, implement these loans when it first came out. And so I did finally get it. Um, it was finally forgiven. So I'm thrilled that I got it and it was free money. And, uh, you know, fortunately that business has not had to shut down for any length of time because of COVID sickness. 
Um, so I actually still have some of that money in the bank. Uh, we did take a dip um, last year, but uh, I still have some of that money in the bank. The unfortunate thing is my business, that business did not does not qualify for the second round of PPP. Okay, so let's talk about that because I thought it was interesting on the criteria because uh, Keith did indicate there was a couple extra nuances between last year and this year. So if you had qualified last year and you don't qualify this year, what was what is it that made you become disqualified? Well, in this business's case, um, we did have a couple of quarters that in theory would have been way down from the prior year. But um, in this business, we had a, one of our key manufacturers that we represent changed their, their method of accounting basically. And it kind of hurt us because our revenues were actually up in those two quarters. Uh, our profits weren't, but our revenues were up in those two quarters. So it kind of throws us out of the ball game. Right. Cause I did, I took a note down on this one where between 2019 and 2020, you must show a decline of 25% um, to reapply for a second loan, which I thought was fascinating because. But, um, but I think this is important to notify uh, again. I listened to a podcast on this, so I know what I'm talking about. So take all pro. of this with a grain of salt. Okay. But it's, so I was talking to my husband about this because he had that same assumption, but it can be on a quarter basis. So even if you saw as a whole an increase, this is my understanding, this is my understanding, but if you had, you can apply for specific quarters where if you show that there was a decrease in a quarter, you can potentially get some money. So again, talk to your CPA, don't say Aaron told you, please. <laughs> but that was my understanding of it. Like if you have a quarter basis, you can still apply for some money. Got it. And that's my understanding as well. And I, in this business that got the first PPP, um, we had a quarter where we were 21% down, um, but no, no other quarters that were further. Ah, uh, I mean, mm. so mm, you're, like, you're like right there. So gross. Yeah. God, if only you would have lost some more money. It's like, it's like sad. It's like, God, if only you would have lost more money. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing that I thought was interesting, he pointed out was the fact that, um, wait, you, in order to get your second loan, you have to have spent it all before asking for the second loan. So you have to spend all the first loan in order to spend, uh, to qualify to ask for the second loan. Did you guys know that? I thought it was fascinating because I guess it makes sense in a way, right? Because like if you need another loan, it's because you're out of money. Um, but how do you prove that? Like, so I guess send and that would be a paperwork nightmare, right? Like what sending all the receipts of everything I spent for the, the first time around. I, that's, I never knew. Yeah. I mean, even on the quarter question, uh, you know, that I was 21% down, what would prevent me from cooking my books and, and to make that, a, you know, cause those are internal numbers, right? Now, I haven't given them to anybody yet. Well, you know, I could go in and cook the books to make it 26%, you know, but again, you know, if that was ever audited, you could probably catch that, right? Yeah. I'm wondering. I think, go ahead, Eric. I, I think we should go on the assumption that we are all good people with the better, best intentions. And no one is going after this for wrong intentions. Right. It's like, I wouldn't do that. that. Right. No, I, I know. That, I know. But I'm teasing. But I mean, we all saw the companies at first going in and getting the money who had no closures, who had tons of money in the bank. At their, yeah. Or you hear the stories of people buying very nice cars, et cetera. But we're going to go with all of the evil has been removed from the world and it's all good. Well, that's frustrating because yeah, you hear about the celebrities or, you know, the NFL got money. It's like, Oh my gosh, like what, what am I doing wrong in life apparently? But um, so here's the something I thought was interesting was that um, this year they lowered the number. So instead of having 75% overhead, it's now down to 60%. So uh, that was uh, talking about employee making less than a hundred thousand dollars. Um, so they lowered the number of uh, that you have to attribute to your overhead expenses. Is yeah. that a good yeah. thing necessarily? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't think it's fair that it was all you know, more payroll driven the first time around. So I, I think that's a good system. Um, the other really nice thing about this round is that restaurants can get uh, instead of 2.5 times payroll, 3.5 times payroll. And that's just awesome because restaurants are getting killed. 
during this whole thing. That is huge. Yes, you're you're right on that. Like, uh, there are certain industries, and I, and I noticed that Keith kept saying that he was clarifying. You know, you wanted to make sure uh, that was clear because I think there's. I mean, has anyone ever done any stats on that of like the amount of um, businesses that went out of business as a result of this pandemic? Have you got gotten the beginnings of those stats yet? I've heard numbers thrown around, but I don't, I don't recall what they were, but it's pretty staggering. It's crazy. It's crazy. You know, what's interesting about this whole thing too. So I've been really perplexed by the fact that half our country is shut down and yet the stock market is the highest it's ever been. Right. So it's like, how is this happening? It just almost feels false. But I read an article that basically broke it down. There's several factors at play in why we're seeing the stock market the way it is. But one of the biggest factors was the PPP loans and just being able to feed and keep these people alive. Like whether we should print money or not, that's a whole nother story. However, it very, it's very interesting that these loans are what's keeping everything very much afloat. I know you guys thought it was the $600 we're sending everybody. It's not. <laughs> Wait, it's not? Hold on a second. I know, I know. But no, it was just a very interesting thing. Like we see all these, you know, it, it is free money essentially, but it is what, what's, what's keeping us, whether that's going to remain, that's a whole other question. But anyway, so there's some good from the PPP loans. Yeah, there definitely is. I mean, the business that I got the loan for, uh, you know, for two months at the, at the beginning of the first shutdown, um, you know, our revenues just took a dive um, and, and it was very scary. So that PPP loan actually did keep us afloat. Um, you know, we ended up not really needing all of that money, but that business is still operating and could shut down any day now. It, 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 you know, if we get one case of COVID sickness among the employees, basically the whole business got to shut down for two weeks. You know, at least for the people who who have to show up every day, the, that por portion of the business. So it's still scary. That level of uncertainty, absolutely. So, you guys, I need to ask you a question. Um, and again, forgive me uh, preemptively, everyone that's going to be listening to this. But they said the maximum was two million. Is it annual revenue he's talking about? Um, and four million for group businesses. I was curious. Was that gross revenue, net revenue? How are they? Uh, capping these businesses of what i think is it two million to what you can receive maybe that's what i'm i mean i i just wrote that down i just i got confused yeah i'm pretty sure that's the cap on what you can receive as, okay. as the max loan rather than you know the revenues but got it but again don't quote me either <laughs> are you sure Come on, guys. Let's put a let's put some feet to our fire here. What are we What are we predicting for? No. So, uh, one of the things that I thought was good was uh, so Keith Kirkland again with ACAP, who was gracious enough to be our Q and A guy. Um, he did recommend for anyone that has questions to go to the loansource.com. Did anyone or have you guys had a chance to check it out yet? I did not. It is so straightforward. Like I looked at it this morning to check it out, and you just literally it's the loansource.com. And you just follow the clicks and you kind of just go down and um, it's almost like um, uh, what's that called? You know, uh, dummies for PPP loan uh, apl application. It's pretty cool. So I do want to give a shout out to them and thank them for, for making that easy for us. Well, the other thing is we should uh, give glow a plug because um, that not only does glow have a portal to, to uh, actually apply for these new PPPs, but there are people at Glow that will answer questions um, who are who are yeah. more knowledgeable than the three of us, and will answer questions about PPP loans. Um, so that's a great resource. Absolutely, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Jay. So yeah, if you go to the withglow.com and you log in as a member, you can sign up for free. Obviously, as you become a full and premium member, premium member to be in local chapters and then full for online uh, interaction. Uh, there is a section specifically for uh, looking at capital and underneath that would be the PPP loan and the process around that. And we've got such a great team of folks over at Glow that, I mean, it's such a great resource. I, I, I haven't taken advantage of it and I feel bad that I haven't yet, but everyone on the Dallas crew that has, and which by the way is half of them, uh, they've had nothing but positive interactions. So for sure, for sure, um, definitely check it out. 
So Jay, let's talk about, you know, what's going on in your chapter, because I know there's some stuff coming up here and I would definitely want to give you a plug and, and, and make sure that we, we celebrate Pittsburgh. Thanks. Um, so yeah, we're having monthly chapter events, unfortunately virtual at this point. Um, my next event is February 9th at 5 p.m. Eastern. And it, in this case, everyone is welcome to attend. These are basically prospecting events at this point. Um, so anyone is welcome to register and attend. Our event on February 9th, I'm really excited for, we have Deb Gabor, who's a branding expert and the title of her talk on the 9th is Branding is Sex, How to Get Your Customers Laid and Sell the Hell Out of Anything. <laughs> I love her. She's yeah. a hoot. She was awesome. Yeah, She's I, can't, I can't wait for her. Oh yeah, yeah. well, have fun with, she is fun. I, it's almost gonna be more the watch your time. You guys are gonna just start having like conversations and before you know it's done. Yeah. Yeah, so our format on the ninth is the first half hour is just a meet and greet for all the entrepreneurs that that show up, uh, just introduce themselves, and then uh, Deb will talk for forty five minutes, and then the premium members will go into a breakout room for for a you know VIP breakout Q and A with Deb uh, after the event. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, I mean, right now yours is all virtual. Like, what what is the city of Pittsburgh like? What's their stance right now on on gatherings in general. I'm curious. Yeah, I, you know, it changes all the time. So I think there's a limit of no more than 25 at, at right now in terms of gatherings. Our restaurants are open 50%, salons are open, um, you know, which w ha hasn't always been the case for sure. We, we've been a state that, you know, open, close, open, close, open, close. Um, so right now things are, you know, fairly opened up, but cases are spiking. I mean, the, you know, compared to March and April, our cases per day in, in the county in, in the city of Pittsburgh are, I, I think, five to 10 times higher than they were in March and April when we thought that was kind of when it was peaking before the first shutdown. So, yeah, yeah it's, it, you know, it's kind of scary that things are peaking yet we're, you know, and but it's hard. I mean, I, I don't know how to, you know, you, you, you know, you want the restaurants to stay alive and and that kind of thing, but um, it's it's scary. It is. I, I'm torn on it, right? Because, you know, Aaron and I, we do have our podcast studios. We are out and about. We do sanitize every single time someone comes in, someone goes out. Um, and we, we're taking all the precautions, but yet at the same time, it's kind of like, it's always in the back of your mind. I mean, Aaron, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'm of the belief that if you're immunocompromised, stay at home, you shouldn't be out and about. But I'm also, I, I feel like, you know, we're, we're gonna get it. I, I think I've already had it, we're gonna get it at some point. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, take care of yourself the best you can. But if you have health concerns, absolutely do not go out. So, um, and be, you know, obviously take the precautions meeting people and, and together. I know I've been exposed several times because of the studio. Uh, after the fact, hey, I tested positive. You know, and it's, what's hard is as a business owner understanding the precautions. Like, okay, well, if it was a week after we were together, how do I handle this? Versus if it was a day after we were together, how do I handle this? It's just been, um, you know, understanding who to tell and what. And uh, like Sia's comment is like a venereal disease. You just kind of tell everybody you've had in contact with. <laughs> Uh, have you but, done? Have you done? Have you done that call of shame, Jay? Because Aaron and I certainly have. <laughs> yeah, luckily, I, yeah. No, I have not had Jay's that face pleasure. Is very red. Yeah, I, I've not had that pleasure for that call. Ah, uh, well, let me tell you. There's like I was actually talking to a a, a client, uh, and and she's amazing. So Stephanie Vajda, thank you. It was awesome. Uh, she'd been following us for the last year and a half, uh, Aaron, she used to go to all our, you know, you know innovation calling, uh, women tech leadership, uh, you know, speaker series. And she actually asked me yesterday, she goes, Hey, see a quick question for you. I'm like, sure. She goes, Hey, you know, you're a coffin last year. Do you think you had it then? And I'm like, Oh man, you and like 20 other people asked me that. And it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, you know, I, we've had to make the phone call and be like, Hey guys, I think I might've been exposed or someone did call us. It's been a week. Just want to give you a heads up. 
And yet at the same time, you're like, I don't feel like we're bad, but I feel dirty at the same time. This whole, this experience has been very bizarre, I think. Oh, I think that event in February, that was when we didn't know anything about it. When we just got, I, I, I think it ran rampant. And I think it was running rampant everywhere. Like half my kid's school was out at that time. That, I mean, I think, every, I really think there was a lot of it. It wasn't that it just got here in March by any means. Cause no. even in November, my husband's a chiropractor and he said to me, this is, there's something really weird going around. Like he said, it's upper respiratory, it's negative as flu. I mean, before we even knew it was coming in China, like he said that he's like, it's very weird. Uh, they're testing negative for flu, they're testing negative for strep. And I mean, it was like, like I said, my kid's class, like this was beginning of March, cause we all, end of February, beginning of March, cause we all basically quarantined uh, for that time. I mean, half his class was out and it just was running through school. It was running. And I remember like uh, even schools uh, around here, like classes were just gone, like from something going around that nobody could quite figure out what it was. So I, I do not believe March was our first case here at all. No, I have a brother who was hospitalized in early February and she spent three days in the hospital. They eventually released him undiagnosed um, and he, you know, it turns out he has, he had 11 of the 12 symptoms of COVID at that oh time. My. So he definitely had it, but they didn't even know what it was then. Gosh. I mean, it, it's, this is something I think it's going to be part of our new normal. I think as we move on in life, right. Until we figure out a way with these vaccines, if it's going to be effective or not, it's just going to be part of our way of life. So as entrepreneurs, as we are working to grow our business, do you think we're going to have to develop a culture of remote interaction and connection? So like what we're doing right now, do you think we are going to have to accept that this is the way business will be conducted? Or do you think we're going to naturally rebel as humans and just force our way to human, you know, physical I interaction? I think there's always going to be both. I think there's going to be people too who like, I, I think one thing we've realized it can be effective, right? You know, people working from home, connecting from home, there is an effectiveness that can happen for it where I think a lot of people didn't believe that before. And I think there's going to be people who, I, it's interesting to me. I mean, I think the flu is, can be just as deadly. Like my kid, my child was in a hospital four or five years ago there. I mean, it was extremely scary over the flu. What I hope this does is we stop making heroes out of people who show up sick to work, whether it's COVID or a flu or anything. I hope people are more aware at this point that I don't feel good, so I'm going to mask up or I'm not even going to leave the house, right? And I hope that helps. So they, they understand they're not missing out. I can join virtually. I can have Zoom coffee over you. Even if I'm not feeling well, we can still do this, but I still think we will crave and we will do in person when it makes sense to also. Oh. Yeah, so I have a prediction. Um, I think that the virtual world is going to become somewhat the new normal. It's going to take a while because right now, you, you know, you hear the term Zoom fatigue. Um, you know, we're all doing this so much right now that it just gets tiring. So e even for like my Pittsburgh event, um, events that are virtual right now, it's hard to get people to say, yes, I want to go to another Zoom webinar or you know, Zoom talk. Um, but I think that once that once things get more normalized, then I think that Zoom fatigue is going to drop and people are going to be more open to these kind of virtual opportunities um, in a positive way. Um, and I'll give you an example. One of the things I do, I've, uh, one of my businesses is pureadvisorgroups.com. And what I focus on there um, are, are on consultants and coaches and solopreneurs and startups is, is my target audience. And we get together monthly for uh, an entrepreneur's peer learning uh, meeting. And you know, right now, obviously we're doing that virtually. Um, for my Pittsburgh groups, we will eventually be doing that again in person. But I think there, you know, there's a great opportunity after all this normalizes for those virtual, to, to form virtual groups doing that. And, and, and in the past, there's always been a resistance to that um, kind of, you know, well, it's not the same when you're virtual and, 
you don't you know sort of get that connection as much but i think that's going to drop off after this and and once things normalize i think people are going to be much more open to you know real kind of virtual experiential kinds of relationships as opposed to before where it was hard to do that or hard to get people to accept that oh i hear you on that you know what uh i think also is going to be my prediction too over time is that uh and i don't know how many businesses are going to love this but the idea of that eight to five work schedule Monday through Friday, I think it's going to go by the wayside. I think it's if as we stay home for those that can do their jobs remotely, I feel like, hey, if I got to go take my kid to the dentist, I'm taking my kid to the dentist and I'll just work at 8 p.m. and get my documentation or whatever I need out. Um, I, I feel like that standard work week is going to blur uh, over time. So productivity, I don't think will go down. I just think it'll be done differently than I think what we expect it to be. Well, aren't they showing that by working from home, productivity is going up? There was a study, I think Wall Street Journal had an article about that, about the increase in productivity by people working from home. Cause you're like, we think we're working, but we're talking to our coworkers, you know, it's like, we're doing all this stuff that's really not working. Like, I can't tell you how many times, I'm like, I'm bored. I'm gonna go get some coffee. Like that, like in an office, I would do that all the time or smoke, I never smoke, but smoke breaks and stuff like that. Like. We think we're being so productive, but when you're at home and that's what you're focused on, and to your point, Sia, maybe I, I don't shut down the computer and walk away and at five o'clock and that's done. It's it's there all the time, which is a good and bad thing, but you got that access. Eh, I'm watching some Netflix. I can get some work done while I'm watching some Netflix. You know, you've got all these different opportunities that I, I do think there will be actually, I, I, and I, I'll pull the, I'll find it. I'm pretty sure it was Wall Street Journal showing the increase in pro productivity. Oh, I love that. You know, you could also be doing, Aaron, is listening to podcasts while you're multitasking. I can't do that. I can't, I can't do that with people. I need to have like a focus on a podcast. Otherwise, I miss important pieces. Oh, well, I don't know what podcast you're listening to. I think you listen to like the very intellectual deep ones. Those, yeah, I understand like you want to focus on. But I'm like listening to like, you know, super lighthearted if I miss a few minutes, it's not going to be life threatening. Jay, what about you? How are you multitasking? Well, in terms of the productivity, um, so one of the things that I, one of the habits I've developed uh, during this is I, because I am working from home, I walk every day. I, I do like a 45 minute power walk. And what I learned over time is that I need to do it in the morning. Like I need to take mid morning and go do that because I'm literally twice as productive the rest of the day after I've done that then you know if i did that normal you know either before 8 a.m or after 5 p.m uh kind of walk um that's just it's one of the things helped me cope with all this nice so on that note uh we're wrapping up on time here so jay always appreciate you and um is there a way that we can get a hold of you sir for those that would love to learn more about you and b2b coach am i b2b coach yeah, it's very simple. It's J at fairbrother, F A I R brother.com. Excellent. And uh, just a reminder again for your Pittsburgh events, the dates February 9th at 5 p.m. Deb Gabor, branding is sex how to get your customers laid and sell the hell out of anything. <laughs> Sorry. Deb is <laughs> just the way she's so unabashed, by the way, of saying that. It just cracks yeah. me up a little bit. And Aaron, let's let's uh, do our pitch for Glow. Yeah, so all of this is in thanks to Glow, which is an awesome community of business owners and entrepreneurs. We understand today's topic is not sexy, and that's why you go to Jay's event for the sexy stuff. But listen, that's part of running a business, though. Like, I have to do 1099s. I'd rather poke my eyes out with a spoon, but we have to get this stuff done in order to run a business, so some of it isn't that. But just to have those resources of the good stuff and the not-so-fun stuff, they're all required to run a business. So head over to withglow.glo.com. We've got these series every week. Uh, we'd love for you, if you're watching from Dallas, to be part of the Dallas chapter at a premium level. And if you're in Pittsburgh, join Jay at a premium level and you get extra perks and access. Absolutely. And next week, we are expecting a uh, somewhat familiar face for us Glow members, Kent Billingsley. He's actually the uh, executive uh, chair manager. Per what is his title, you guys? He, he managed executive, us chairs. Executive VP of chairs. 
There we go. But he's also his own entrepreneur and very successful at that long tenured career with a lot of global 500 organizations. He is the founder and president of Revenue Growth Company. He's got a book coming out and he's joining us next week in Dallas. So I'm going to extend this olive branch out for those that are comfortable in gathering in Dallas. We are going to be filming live. You'll have direct access to Kent Billingsley uh, on top of the VIP premium access. So if you're interested in that, reach out to Aaron or myself. It's Sia Yasso Tornrat. If you're watching this, you already have my info. Um, or Aaron Greger, and uh, we can be sure to add you on the list. It is limited seating. Uh, so ping us over on LinkedIn or if you know our emails or Innovation Media Enterprises, uh, we'll be happy to accommodate you. First come, first serve. On that note, everyone, any fi final thoughts, Aaron? Jay? Go PPP. Go, P <laughs> Go PPP, if you know me. Okay, sorry. I'll just, I'll just sign off. Bye. Bye, guys. Have a great, safe weekend.